All right, so you're there in the book of Philemon. Keep your place there. Go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3.16. Like I said, we're going to be there for the whole sermon, so make sure you don't lose your place in Philemon. But just turn to 2 Timothy 3.16 real quickly. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, the Bible says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So according to this verse here in 2 Timothy 3.16, every single word of God has a purpose. It gives us some examples of here. It says doctrine. Doctrine is learning who God is, how he thinks, his rules, his judgments. Then you have reproof and correction. This is God telling us why we're wrong, where, are, where we are wrong, and how to get right. And then you have, at the end, instruction in righteousness. This is how to live righteously and according to God's will. And every, everything in the Bible falls under at least one of those categories. Doctrine, reproof, correction, or instruction in righteousness. And what this means is that everything in the Bible is there for a very specific reason. You don't have to turn there, but Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. You see, as people, we just talk just to talk. Sometimes we just talk because we like to talk, and it doesn't really have a specific reason. We just talk for no reason. But when God speaks, everything he says is very, for a very specific reason. When God is saying something, it's because there is something he's going to accomplish with his word. And all that to say this, have you ever wondered why certain parts of the Bible are there? Sometimes when you're reading, you're reading maybe Chronicles, and you're reading the genealogies, and it's chapter 8, 9, 10, 11 of just names, or you're reading Ezra, or certain parts of the Bible you're reading, and something in the back of your head just kind of makes you wonder, like, why is this here? When you're reading and uh, a story will pop up. I, one thing I'm always intrigued by is in Chronicles in particular, you have a couple times where a story will pop up that only lasts for two verses about some completely random person we've never heard about. Have you ever wondered, why is this here? What is God trying to tell us with this part of the Bible? And I think Philemon, which is going to be our text for this evening, can sometimes be like that. You know, we're on Wednesday evenings, we're going through Galatians, and we're reading about these great, complicated uh, uh, defense po defenses Paul is going to, into defending doctrine and talking about eternal security and defending uh, salvation by grace through faith and these, these analogies and these, these, these different, just pure doctrine and these very deep parts of the Bible. And you read Philemon and it kind of sticks out. You say, there's no doctrine in Philemon. There's no, there's not a big interesting story in Philemon. It's just a short letter from Paul about some guy. Well, I actually, Philemon, Philemon is one of my favorite books in the Bible. And because I believe God gave us the book of Philemon for a very specific reason that I'd like to show you this evening. So the title of the message this evening is Why God Gave Us the Book of Philemon. I'd like to give you three lessons we can learn from this book. And I'd like to end it with like I said, what I believe is a very specific reason God gave us this book and he's trying to get across in the book of Philemon. First this evening is this. First lesson we can learn from Philemon is we see a lesson on listening to counsel. A lesson on listening to counsel. Let's go ahead and just start reading in verse 1 to start this story, see what this book is all about. Philemon verse 1 says this, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy our brother, our brother, Unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow labor. So notice as we go forward, you're going to see that this Philemon, he's someone who has a great reputation, especially with Paul. Someone who, who is obviously known as being a great man and a great godly man. Verse 2, And to our beloved Ophia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. So it may, of course, just be that Philemon just provided the physical location for a church, but he could have been a pastor. This church was in his house. He could have been the pastor of this church. We don't know that, obviously. It could just be that that's just where the church was physically located. Verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. Of course, Paul was always praying for people. Verse 5, Hearing of thy love and faith, 
which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. So he just starts off with this very uplifting, positive greeting to Philemon. And we see the reputation that Philemon had. But in verse 8, he kind of switches gears here a little bit. Verse 8, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. He's saying, as much as I'd love just to go on and on about how great you are and that which is convenient and fun to talk about. Verse 9, he says, Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past to thee was unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and me, whom I have sent again. Now therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind I, would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. So there's this guy named Onesimus, that Paul apparently got saved. He says, he calls him, uh, he says, I have begotten him in my bonds. This is how Paul talks about people such as Timothy that uh, he led to Christ or that were led to Christ as a result of his ministry. There's this man that uh, Paul got saved and Paul is asking Philemon to receive him. You say, why? What did this guy do? Uh, verse 15, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Verse 17, If thou therefore count me as a partner, partner receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. So this man, Onesimus, he in some way, it doesn't get very specific, but in some way he did Philemon wrong. My opinion is, is that he was a servant of Philemon and he left or he ran away. Maybe he even stole something from him. The Bible doesn't get very specific, but somehow this man has come to Paul. Paul has now gotten him saved. And Paul is sending him back, obviously, with this letter. And he's asking Philemon to receive him. Um, like I said, we don't, it isn't, not, it's not very specific. But I just wanted to set the story up a little bit. My, the point is... In verse 8, like I said, he starts off with this very uplifting message to Philemon. And then in verse 8, he says, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee. So he is, the idea is that Paul is telling Philemon something he knows he probably doesn't want to hear. In the same way as Paul is giving this counsel that he expects Philemon to listen to, we need to be willing to receive counsel or advice when it's given to us. Go ahead and turn to Proverbs 20, 18. Proverbs 20, verse 18. And obviously a disclaimer that goes along with this that I think is left out a lot is be careful on whose counsel and whose advice and what advice you take. Because one thing is for sure, there is a lot more people out there who are willing to give you advice than there is actual good advice. There are tons of people out there who would love to tell you what they think you should do and tons of people who would love to just give you advice who have nothing but bad advice to give. So a couple questions just to ask yourself as a precursor when it comes to taking advice is ask yourself, does this person have credibility in this area? Does this person have experience? Do they even know what they're talking about in this area? If, if you're married and some, you shouldn't be listening to someone who is not married give you advice on what you should do in your marriage. If, you don't, if someone doesn't have kids and you do, you should not be listening to that person for advice on what you should do with with your children. Make sure that the person has credibility in that area. If someone's giving you advice on a career or a job, do they even have a job? Just things to ask yourself, just common sense questions. And obviously, it should all line up with scripture. That's why you have to know the Bible well enough, because when people come up to you, like they will, and try to tell you what they, should, what they think you should do and give you advice in your life, you should know the Bible well enough to at least ask yourself, is this what the Bible says? Is this advice that is good, that is good wisdom according to the Bible? And there in Proverbs 20, 18, the Bible says this, Every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice make war. Notice it doesn't just say with advice, it says with good advice. Make sure the advice is good. And I like this phrase here where it says, with good advice make war. I think there's a specific point to this phrase. Proverbs 24, 6, you don't have to turn there, says, For by wise counsel, again, make sure it's wise counsel, 
thou shalt make thy war, and in the multitude of counselors there is safety. I think the idea here is that a war, when a country is deciding to go to war with another country, that's a big decision. There, that's a big decision with some heavy consequences whether, when you're deciding going to war with another nation, which is why, by the way, it's supposed to be, uh, you know, you're supposed to have a declaration of, you're supposed to, you know, go, go through Congress for that, not just declare war as a president. But it's a big decision. It's a big decision, and I think the idea here is that when you in your life, when you're making the wars in your decision, in your life, when you're doing the big, making the big decisions in your life, that's probably something you want to back by counsel. The counsel, especially in a church like this, counselors and people here who are godly people with advice, it's like a safety net for you. This verse says, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You should use that safety net because why wouldn't you? you there's, there's tons of people here who are godly, who know the Bible, who have more experience than you in certain areas. Why wouldn't you take that advice? It's, a, it's, a, it's for your own benefit. Another thing, too, is that everybody needs advice from time to time. Sometimes people, I think, get this idea that I've arrived, I'm there, I don't need advice anymore. I, I just give people advice, and, and I, I know everything there is, and there is nothing I need advice on. I don't need anyone telling me what to do. Well, consider this. King Solomon, who, of course, we know is the wisest man who ever lived. Solomon, who had people come from all over the world to just hear him talk. Keep, people came from all over the world and brought him gifts just to just to hear his wisdom, the Bible says even Solomon had counselors. Even Solomon at one point got, got, uh, had decided to himself, you know what, I need advice on this. I should not make this decision on my own. Even Solomon, who was wiser than any of us in this room, said, I need advice. I, I need someone who I can, people who I can go to for advice. And the ironic thing is the part of the Bible that tells us that Solomon had counselors was talking about Rehoboam, his son, who ruined his kingdom because he didn't listen to those counselors. So just irony there. But not just advice. What about just correction? Philemon in this story didn't really do anything wrong. He was just receiving advice or, correct, or, or, or counsel from Paul. But correction falls under the same lines. You don't have to turn there, but Proverbs 27, verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You say, who would be giving me correction in my life? Well, your friends if, should be ready to. If you're doing something that is, is wrong, if you have good friends and not just people who are trying to deceive you and, and flatter you, they will give you correction when they see you need it. But obviously you don't want to be a jerk friend, so you know, don't be the guy who's just uh, telling everybody what to do all the time. But if you have good friends, you should be willing to receive that correction when it comes to you from your friends. Go ahead and turn to Amos 4.2. So when reproved or just given advice, just listen. Just listen and hear what people have to say. You don't have to turn there, but while you're turning to Amos, Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Someone who despises, there's tons of people like that. People who just, they can't stand being told what to do, and they can't stand being corrected, and they can't stand being given, being given advice. That's a fool, according to the Bible. When you're given advice, at least just listen. At the very least, just listen and be humble enough to change. So, not just friends, but what about the man of God? What about the spiritual leader in your life? Brother Jared, when he preaches the Word of God to you, you uh, especially in a church like this that is preaching the whole Bible, you no doubt are going to hear sermons on things that you need to change. When you hear those things, what will your response be? You're there in Amos. The background on Amos is uh, Amos was a, a prophet when Uzziah was king of Judah, Jeroboam II was king in Israel, and it was also during the time of Hosea the prophet as well. Let's start reading in verse 6. Hosea 4 6 says this, and I, also, and I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and want of bread in all your places, yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have also I have withholden the rain from you when there were yet three months to harvest. And I caused it to rain upon one city, and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, and the piece whereupon it rained, not withered. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water, but they, have not, they were not satisfied. Yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew, when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm devoured them. Yet have ye not returned unto me, 
saith the Lord. So as a reading, just notice the horrible time that this nation is in. Imagine, put yourself in their shoes. Imagine if this, what is being described, was happening in the United States right now. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword and taken away your horses. And I have made the stink of your camps to come up unto your nostrils. Yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. So Amos here is preaching. And he's saying, you know, the famine and the disease and, and the terrible time that this nation is going through, it is because God is cursing you for your sin. Ouch. Can you imagine if someone said that today, uh, uh, if our nation was going through an extremely terrible time and someone just came out and said, it's because God's cursing you. And obviously, in this specific instance, Amos was told by God himself that this was his judgment. Today, we ought to be a little more careful. We're not God and we're not having God speak to us telling us what is his judgment and what is not. But in this particular situation, Amos was told by God, this is my judgment, and he was telling this to them. Uh, verse 12, Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. For lo, he that formeth the mountains, and createth the wind, and declareth unto man what is his thought, and maketh the morning darkness, and treadeth upon the high places of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. And this is really the whole theme of Amos. If I, I've often thought before as I read Amos, if you could sum up the whole book into one word, it'd be this, hate. The, 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 the word hate comes up a lot in Amos. You see a lot of those, it'd actually be a good sermon, quite frankly, on all the hate statements in Amos, where God says, I hate your feast days. I hate the evil and love the good. There I hated them, things like this. It's a very harsh book to this nation. And you say, what was their response? Turn to Amos 7. What was their response to being heavily corrected by the man of God in their time? Amos 7.10 says this, Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. So, here, this is not a Levite, okay? This is not a priest of God. If you remember when the kingdoms first split, the first Jeroboam, he set up two golden calves. Remember where he set them up? In Dan and in Bethel. So this priest here, this is not a priest of God. This is a false priest of this, this false god that Jeroboam uh, a long time earlier had set up in Bethel. And Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. Notice what he says here. The land is not able to bear his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said to Amos, O thou seer, go flee thee away into the land of Judah, and eat bread, and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. You know, at least they were honest. You know, because everybody who refuses to listen and refuses to change, I'll say, to hard preaching and preaching that is directed at their life, this is really, they may not admit it, but that's what they're thinking. We can't bear it. We're not able to bear your words. It's too much for us. And just as a side note, I think it's interesting. Notice Amaziah goes, he's not very harsh against Amos, he, but he tells him, he says, don't pre preach here in Bethel. Why don't you just go to Judah? And you know, people who don't like correction from the Bible, this is, they do the same thing. They don't want the preaching done in the Bethels of their life. They don't want the preaching done on the areas of their life where the false gods are set up and where the sin's at. The reason most people don't go to churches that preach the whole Bible is they want to hear preaching on the Judas of their life where there's not as much sin. They want to hear preaching on the areas where they already are, 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 have, have down pretty good. They want to hear the easy sermons. They don't want to hear the sermons in Bethel, in, right up in their face in the areas that they need to change. Man does not change. It's, there's no new thing under the sun, that is for sure. So you say, okay, that's the wrong response. Turn to 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7. You say, what's the right response? If that's what I'm not supposed to do, if I'm supposed to take correction, I'm not supposed to respond like they did, how do I respond to correction from the man of God? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. The context of this here is, of course, Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians, he was rebuking the Corinthians for some serious sin they had in their church. Uh, besides Galatians, I, I personally think it's the harshest rebuking he had. 
to, to any church or any letter he wrote, and he corrected them on a lot of things. There was a lot of things they were doing very wrong that he rebuked them for and, and said, you need to change this and you need to do it this way. This is not what God wants in your church. And in, verse, in 2 Corinthians, this is after they have changed and he is writing to them. Verse 8, he says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I did not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, but it were for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for that you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. You see, a lot of people, the reason they don't like churches that preach the whole Bible is they have this sorrow. That just like the Corinthians felt, they, they go and they say, it's, just, it's, it's hard and it's just a bunch of sorrow and I feel bad every time I leave. But here's what people miss. If done correctly, the sorrow is only temporary. The idea is that the sorrow it hits you really hard the first time you hear it. And you say, I need to work on that. And that convicted me. And you have that godly sorrow. But the goal is that that should be the only time you have that sorrow. Because the idea is that you go home and you change it. And it's a godly repentance. And it's a repentance, and if, you, if done correctly, that sorrow will only be one time. Now, if you come to a church like this, and you just refuse to change, and you know where you need to fix things, and you know where you need to change, and you refuse to, then there's going to be a lot of sorrow. Every time you come here, you're gonna, there's going to be a lot of sorrow because you won't change. But the idea is that you change, and there, that sorrow ends. Uh, you don't have to turn there. Turn to Proverbs 9.8. But Ecclesiastes 7.5 says this, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. A very simple verse saying that it is better to hear something you don't want to hear from someone who is wise than something you, you do want to hear from someone who is a fool. And very similar to the idea on, correct, on, on advice, we all need to be corrected by the word of God every once in a while. Unless you are Jesus Christ and you don't sin anymore, you should, be, you should hear a sermon every once in a while and think, I do need to work on that. If you sit here and you, and you listen to all the sermons and you, you, there is nothing that makes you think, I need to work on that. I'm not doing very well in that area. Then either one, you have attained perfection, or two, you're shrugging everything off and you're refusing to admit it to you. We all need to be corrected by the Word of God. Proverbs 9, 8 says this, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Someone is wise, then when they are rebuked, they will appreciate that. When they are told an area they need to change, they will, they will, they will appreciate the fact that they were told, and they will change. But of course, the other side of this verse says, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. I usually think of the, you hear this saying a lot, Someone who refuses to listen will soon be surrounded by people who have nothing to say. That's what this is saying. Because you see this. You have people who think they are far above counsel and they are far above correction. And you know what people around them do? They don't say anything. This is where you get a group of people and you'll have someone just telling everybody how it is and how much they know and how awesome they are and just spewing wisdom and knowledge that they think they're better. Do you know what everybody else in that group is doing? They're not saying anything. Right. Oh, okay, okay. Because this, that person has got themselves to the point where people have just stop trying with that person. They've just stopped trying and that person just refuses to listen to correction or even just, just counsel from anybody. And certain people, they, they don't listen to the preaching. They refuse to admit it's them and this is who they become. They become almost, a, they almost develop an immunity to the preaching where they just refuse. Pastor Menes would, would talk about a lot in, in, in Sacramento how so he'd preach a sermon and he'd be talking about one person and everybody would feel super bad and felt like he was talking about them except for that person. Because that tells you, about, that tells you a lot about someone who refuses to change. So when, you, when those around you, your friends or the man of God, are trying to give you correction or just advice, or just advice in the area that they think uh, you, you could need it, humble yourself and listen. Because it takes humility to listen to correction. It takes humility to say, you know what, I, I was wrong in this area. I did mess up in this area. Or when someone's just giving you advice, it takes humility to say, you know what, I, maybe this person knows more than me in this area. So first tonight from Philemon, we see a lesson on listening to counsel. Second this evening, we see a lesson on forgiving our brothers in Christ and why. Let's uh, keep reading in, in Philemon verse 10. Philemon 1.10 says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, who I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past to thee was unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and me, 
whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind I would do nothing, that thy benefit should, it, should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. Verse 15, for, there, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved. So he's telling Philemon, he's saved now. He's, he's not just your servant, but he's a brother in Christ, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou, there, if thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. Turn to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. So, Again, uh, Onesimus uh, obviously did Philemon wrong in some way. And Paul is asking him to forgive him, to receive him. Turn to Matthew 18 and verse 21. Matthew 18, 21, the Bible says this, then, ca then came Peter unto him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. So, Peter is coming to Jesus here, and he thinks he's being generous. He's saying, Lord, if my brother sins against me, should I forgive him seven times? I mean, surely seven times is enough. That's, I mean, if someone has done you wrong and you've forgiven them seven times, that's a lot. And Jesus says here, he says, I say not unto thee until seven, seven times, but seventy times seven. And the idea isn't that he's saying only forgive 490 times. The idea, he's saying, no, you should never get to a point where you stop forgiving somebody. You say, why? Well, he goes on to tell a story. This is one of my favorite stories or parables that Jesus told. Verse 23, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. For so, for, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had to payment, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me. I will pay thee all. So we don't know what it's talking about here, silver or gold, but in the Bible, a talent's a lot of money. If you look at, for, for example, when Solomon's building the temple, and you look at how much a talent got, a talent is a lot of money. And this man owes a lot, uh, a lot of money to this king, and he's begging for mercy, because if you remember in the Old Testament how it worked, is if you owed money, you, you didn't just get to declare bankruptcy. If you owed money, you had to work to pay that money off, to pay that debt off. You weren't just allowed to, say, declare bankruptcy and basically steal from whoever you borrowed that money from. And this man, he is totally at his mercy, and he's just begging him for mercy. Verse 27, Then the Lord of this, that servant was moved with compassion. Does that remind you of, of a phrase that's used to describe somebody else in the New Testament? Jesus is always described as this, as with this phrase, how Jesus was moved with compassion on the multitude. He is moved with compassion on on this person, and loosed him and forgave him the debt. So he just wipes the slate clean and says, you're forgiven of the entire debt. Verse 28, but that same servant, so this man that was just forgiven of an enormous amount of money, went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. That's like a dollar. It was a very minute amount. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me that thou owest. Verse 29, his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, just like he, this, this man was verses before, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called them, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee of all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest thou not also have compassion on thy fellow servant? Notice this. Even as I had pity on thee, and his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So like my, likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Maybe there's someone you could say of, what has this person ever done for me? What is the, this person has just done me wrong. I didn't do anything to them. They don't, I don't owe them anything. And you may be right. But you say, you say why should I forgive them? If someone has done me wrong and, and they don't deserve anything from me, why should I forgive? You don't have to turn there, but Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind one to another, 
tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And then this is the key, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. The idea is that, you say, how much should I forgive someone? How often should I forgive someone? How many times should I keep forgiving someone? Well, ask yourself this, how much were you forgiven? If you were saved, just like this man, I, I like the detail where it mentions the first man owed uh, a lot of money and the second man owed very little. It's the same concept because no matter what someone does to us, it will never come close to what we were forgiven when we got saved. What we were forgiven of when, when Christ forgave us of our debt, of our sins, is infinitely greater than anything anyone could ever do to us which shows how silly it is. And yet someone does something to us and we hold it against them for years, sometimes even forever. Think about how silly that is. And the idea is that Jesus, much like this king, is saying, I forgave you of, of this, uh, this, this infinite list of sins you had committed so much that, that were so bad you deserved hell for all eternity. And someone does something minor to you, and you, are, you hold a grudge, and you refuse to forgive them, even though they have, they're asking you for mercy. So, and another concept, too, is not just with salvation, but we should show people the mercy in our lives that we want from God. Because even though we're saved, we still mess up, and we still sin. And I'll tell you what, even though I'm saved, I still need a lot of mercy from God. We all need mercy from God because we still make mistakes. Turn to Leviticus 5. You don't have to turn there, but Matthew 6, 14 says, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This verse is used a lot to basically say you can lose your salvation. Oh, if you don't forgive other people and you're not good to other people, God will stop forgiving you. And this verse is... The same reason that people mess up this verse, they also mess up a lot of verses in the Bible and take it out of context. So you say, what does that mean? He's saying he won't forgive us if we don't forgive other people. What's this talking about? You're there in Leviticus, we'll start reading verse 5. It says, And it shall be, when he shall be guilty in one of these things, that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for a sin which he hath sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him considering, concerning his sin. So this is just the details of, one of the many details of an Old Testament offering for somebody's sin in the Bible. Skip to verse 10. And he shall offer the second for a burnt offering according to the manner, and the priest shall make an atonement for him in his sin which he hath sinned, and it shall be forgiven him. So, according to the book of Hebrews and tons of other parts in the Bible, the Old Testament offerings, they were not for, they did not atone for sin. They did not, you didn't go and do this offering and then you could go to heaven. That's not what it was for. The, Old the Bible says the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. They were never for spiritual salvation. They never paid for your sin because nothing except for the blood of Christ can pay for your sin. But the idea was they were a picture of Jesus when he was to come and be the ultimate sacrifice that was one time and pay for the whole world's sin. But this verse kind of gives us our key here because here's just a quick lesson on studying your Bible. A lot of words mean different things. For example, salvation. The word salvation in the Bible it can be used to talk about spiritual salvation. By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Or it can just be talking about a physical salvation. You think about David in the book of Psalms when he'd say, God was my salvation. He was also talking about his physical salvation from his enemies. So it can mean two different things. The word faith. This can talk about just your walk with God, the amount of faith in your life, or the saving faith that you did one time to believe on Christ. Perish, this is another example. Perish can either mean go to hell. Uh, if you think about different verses of the Bible that say, we have to talk about someone who perishing, John, John 10, 28, that's talking about someone going to hell. Or it can just mean someone physically dying. So different words diff mean different things. Forgiveness is the same way. Forgiveness is either, can either talk about the one-time forgiveness that Christ forgave you when you got saved, or it can just talk about the chat from the chastisement of God in your life. Because... Christ will obviously always forgive us once we're saved, but we also need a lot of forgiveness just from the chastisement of God. Um, you turn to, it's the same thing in Matthew 6.15. Turn to Matthew 9.10. So the idea is this. God is asking us, if you don't show others mercy when they mess up, why would I forgive you and spare you? 
Why would I take it easy on you when you make mistakes and not chastise you when you are extremely hard on other people who have done much more minor things than that? There in, in Matthew 9.10, the Bible says this, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. And I love this verse here because you have these Pharisees. They thought they were better than everyone else. And they knew the Bible more than everybody else. And they knew all the complex, deep things of the, of the scriptures. And here Jesus is schooling them on a very basic topic in the Bible. He says in verse 13, But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's saying you can keep your sacrifices. I want mercy more than I want that. And this is the idea. If you want mercy for, from, for, from God in your life, you need to show that same mercy to other people. James 2.13 says, For he shall have judgment without mercy that showed no mercy. When God judges you for the things you do in your life and he chastises you on this earth, he will have little mercy with you or no mercy if that is how you respond to people doing you wrong. Go ahead and turn to Micah 6.8. In, this is how it was in Philemon. Onesimus was still at Philemon's mercy. But Paul still expected Philemon to forgive him, even though he had done him wrong. You're there in Micah 6, 8. While you're turning there, I'll read you the famous verse in Matthew 23, 23, that says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. These ought ye have to done, and not to leave the other undone. So he points out what's known as the weightier matters of the law, the more important things. Yes, it's important to keep the whole Bible, but the main things are judgment, mercy, and faith. And this is interesting, is in Micah 6, 8, uh, we see what I, in my opinion, is the same three things, just worded differently. Here God in Micah 6, 8 is also saying, which by the way shows it's the same God in the Old and New Testament, but he's also listing three main fundamentals of how we want, what he wants people to do, and they're the same three things. He says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. I believe these are the three same things if you look into them just, for, just worded differently. Mercy, but what I'm pointing at here is that mercy in both cases, either way, it's one of the three main things that God wants from you. Mercy is a big deal to God. And if you want mercy from God in your life, which I definitely do, make sure you're showing that mercy to other people because just because someone doesn't know just because someone has done you wrong and, and doesn't deserve anything from you, that does not mean that you sh that you should not show them mercy. Show them the mercy that Christ had for you. So first this evening we said we saw a lesson on receiving, listening to counsel. And second we saw a lesson on forgiving our brothers in Christ and why. But third this evening, and this is really what, again what I think is the main reason God gave us the book of Philemon, what I think the main theme of this book is, we see a lesson on a Christ-like investment into a brother in Christ. Let's keep reading in verse 17, Philemon 117. Notice the language Paul has for this man. This random guy named Onesimus, who was just some servant that Paul got saved, he says, If thou count me, therefore, as a partner, receive him as myself. If he have wronged thee, or owe thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand, I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest even unto me thine own self besides. So Paul just spent the whole book basically begging Philemon to forgive Onesimus and, and just saying, please receive him, and I know he did you wrong, but now he's your brother in Christ. But he gets to the end, and he basically says, just in case, Philemon, you're not willing to forgive him, he says, whatever he owes you, I will repay it. Paul here, who is, who is someone who, who has no, nothing to do with Onesimus, and he didn't, does not owe Philemon anything, he was willing to completely step in his place and say, whatever he owes you, Philemon, I will pay it. Put it on my account. Send me the bill. I will pay you whatever you think he owes you. And you say, what's so significant about that? Well, much like, much like forgiveness, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for you. 
we came to God and, and we had messed up and we had nothing to pay and we were in a completely helpless situation and Jesus Christ took our place and said, no, 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 what he owes, I will pay it. Put it on my account. He owes hell, put it on my account. Yeah, I, I will repay what he owes for his sin. And this is exactly, turn to Acts 15.36. The idea is Jesus Christ invested in you when you did not deserve it to give you another chance. Acts 15, 36, here we have the story of Paul and Barnabas, where they end up splitting up because you had this man named Mark who on one of their missionary journeys had left them and had abandoned them. And Paul and Barnabas were, Barnabas were very close and they, they did multiple mission, missionary journeys together. But in Acts 15, 36, it says, And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we had preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Verse 39, And the contention was so sharp between them. They're arguing because Paul, Paul does not want to take Mark because Mark betrayed them, or he left them, and Barnabas is willing to give Mark another chance. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder, one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So Barnabas here noticed that he was willing to destroy a friendship and split a friendship with some other person <clears throat> just over interceding or investing in someone who had done him wrong. Someone who had left him and didn't deserve it. He was willing to give him another chance. Turn to Mark 14, 12. And this isn't just in Philemon. The whole Bible is full of examples like this. Think about God with Jonah. Jonah messed up. Jonah, uh, Jonah ended up under the chastisement of God because he wouldn't preach. And God gave him another chance. And God invested in him. And, and you know, God didn't say, no, you messed up. I'm going to use somebody else, Jonah. He kept investing into Jonah, even when he had messed up. Think about Jesus with Peter. Even though Peter had betrayed Jesus, he still invested in him. And he still used him to, to be a great tool to spread the gospel throughout the world. God does not give up on people the first time they make a mistake. God is extremely merciful. That's, that's why when people will talk about how, oh, the God of the Old Testament is so mean, it, it's, it, it almost makes me laugh. It's, it's, the Old Testament is a story of mercy, not wrath. The Old Testament is a story of people who kept rejecting God and rejecting God and turning on Him and turning on Him and to the point where they were sacrificing their own children and, and fire and wi to very wicked people, and God kept... God kept giving them chance after chance after chance after chance. That God is, is, is merciful God, much more than he is wrath. That is for sure. Uh, you're there in Luke 14. And obviously, there's a discourse, the disclaimer of who you should not invest in. Okay, People who have been thrown out of a church, people who are stuck in sin and refuse to get right, and people who, it, it all depends on the direction their heart is going. Think about it like that. Someone who is willing to get right even though they have messed up, that's someone you should invest in. Luke 14, 12 says this, Then said he did also to them that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and in recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. Here's why, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Turn to 1 Samuel 22, verse 2. 2 Samuel 22. You see, here's how normal investments work. When you make a normal investment, it, when you, whether it's a stock or whatever it is, you invest in it in hopes that it, will, that it will increase in value, right? You invest in it. The reason you are investing is because you hope you'll get a return on that investment. That's the idea of an investment, not this kind of investment. For example, we're, in, we're talking about Jesus Christ as the ultimate example of this. It doesn't matter if you get saved and you hit the ground running and you get saved and you spend the rest of your life serving God with all your heart. You go to church three times a week. You go soul winning. You do everything. You try as hard as you can. Jesus Christ is still taking a loss on you. He will never get that perfect sinless life back that he put into you. And this is how this, is how this works. This type of investment is done whether or not you see a return on it. This type of investment. You say, what does this look like? You don't have to turn there, but Galatians 6.2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. 
Later in that same chapter, in verse 10, it says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Here's some practical examples. When you get somebody saved, give them a Bible, get, uh, offer to give them a ride, get them into church, uh, show concern for the problems in their lives. Put some investment into that person. You say, they're probably not even going to come to church, and if they do by some miracle, they'll, they'll never come back. Well, you're not doing this investment to receive a return on this. You're doing this because it's what Christ did for you. And this is what the Bible calls for. Invest into people. People at church, visitors, or just your brothers and sisters in Christ. Show concern. Not just show it, but actually have genuine concern for the problems in their lives. People have problems in their lives. Invest into people. Invest time and energy into people. And you say, but I'm not going to get that back. I'm not going to be recompensed for that. Exactly. That's the idea. There in 1 Samuel 22, too, I like reading about David's mighty men. You read about David's mighty men and all these, these men that did these wonderful things and that were these just uh, these highly skilled soldiers of their time. And you read those parts in the Bible. Have you ever wondered where they came from? Where did David's men start from? You know, these men that were very loyal to David, by the way. Whenever David was running from somebody, from Absalom, a lot of people may have left him, but do you know who was always with him? His men. His men were always with him. You ever wondered where did they come from? Where, where did the men that he had, where did it start? Well, in 1 Samuel 22, 2, David is fleeing from Saul. This is before he's king. Saul is after him, trying to kill him. David has done nothing wrong. Notice the people that David takes under his wing when he is in the most difficult time, even in his life. Verse 2, And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. G uh, David here took the people that were in debt, that were messed up, that had messed up lives, that were discontent, that were in trouble, and he said, these are the people I'm going to turn into mighty men. I'm going to invest in these people. These are the people I'm going to... And look what happened. Look at the men uh, that David had, how loyal they were. Look at the mighty men who were, were some of those people. Look, look at all the... And you see this because even people like Joab and, and Abishai, these were people who were with David from the very beginning. Those were the people that David invested in and turned into great people who did great things. And uh, it's funny because I was talking to... I was talking to my mom the other day and you know, just from something I thought about from seeing them in the ministry and, and doing things like that and helping people, I told her, I said, it, it seems like if you could sum up the ministry in one phrase, it would be investing everything you have into people and expecting nothing in return. But that's not only just the ministry. That's how we should all be. If you are here and you are a Christian and you are saved, this is how you should be. You should have the mentality of, I'm going to invest everything I have into people who have room to grow and, and need someone to invest in their life, and that's who, and I'm going to expect nothing in return. You see what that makes it easier? But you get in trouble when you go and you put time and effort into people, and then they, it doesn't turn out like you th thought they would. Well, that's not why you're doing this type of investment. You don't have to turn there, but Romans 15.1 says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. I think by default, what we tend to do, even if we're not being, we're not incredibly selfish people, just what we default, is to just kind of think about pleasing ourselves. We think about what we want, or what we need, or what, what we would like to happen, and we kind of just forget that the goal of your life when it comes to those around you, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ, is to please other people. Uh, it says, let every, let every one of us please his neighbor, for his good to edification. And of course, again, the ultimate example, verse 3, for even Christ pleased not himself. But as it, is, as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. It talks about Christ, how what his mentality was, is he, he took the reproaches that were on us and the debt we owed, and he took it upon himself. Why? Because Christ pleased not himself. That's the idea. The idea is you have to forget about what you want, and you have to invest self, selflessly into other people. So turn to Colossians 4 9. So one more thought before we end tonight. We're talking about this idea of investing into people. One more thought I just I would like to leave you with this evening real quickly and then we'll be done. Uh, you learn Colossians 4 9. Of course Paul is writing to the Colossians and he's just ending his letter and he's going through the list of people like he usually does who are there serving with him. 
the greetings from different people. He says in verse 9, Notice who he mentions, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. These shall make known unto you all the things which are done here. We don't know when this was written. It could have been written after the book of Philemon was written or before. I think it was written before the book of Philemon when Onesimus was with Paul. But either way, it could be said of Paul, which is what we just talked about, that Paul invested into Onesimus. And that's great. That's what we need to do. How Paul invested everything. and He was willing to give everything just for Onesimus. But you know what you can say about Onesimus is that he was a good investment. Paul may have invested a lot into him. But Onesimus was a good investment. Here's the question I'd like to leave you with this evening. Is, are you a good investment? Because if you're saved, you're a big investment. If you, there's been a lot put into you by Jesus Christ if you are saved. But not just if you're saved, if you're part of this church. If you're part of this church, Brother Jared and Miss Heidi have invested enormous amounts of love and energy and time into you. Which, which either way, whether you're a good investment or not, that's fine because that's not why they're doing it. They do it because they love you all and, they're, and that's the type of investment it should be. But are you a good investment? Could it be said to you that, yeah, we invested a lot into that person, but you know what? they're a faithful and beloved brother. I mean, are you, are you providing a return on the investment, not just your spiritual leader, but just people in your life? The efforts put into you, are you returning on that investment? I mean, do you, are you loyal to this church? Are, do you listen to the preaching? Do you, are you willing to change? Are you willing to serve in, in, this, in this church? Are, are you consistent in church? Are you, are you an investment that people are just putting everything into, putting all their energy and time into, and you're just not yielding anything? Which, again, that's fine, because those putting it, investing in you, that's not what they're expecting anyway. They're just investing in you, expecting nothing back, and that's great. But from your own perspective, are you a good investment? Are you returning the energy and the time that's being put into you like Onesimus? Or are you just a, a bottomless pit of energy and time and, and, and things like that? Um, you do, let's, let's finish reading Philemon, verse 19. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. And then this is very interesting. He says, the, the last thing he says on Onesimus here in this whole thing is he says, Albeit, I do not say to thee, how thou owest unto me even thine own self. Paul got Onesimus saved, but do you know who else I believe Paul got, got saved? I believe he got Philemon saved. Paul here is telling him, he just finished this whole thing on, on Onesimus, and he says, and by the way, Philemon, I'm not even going to mention that you owe me your own self. He's, he's telling Philemon, Philemon, remember what was invested in you. Remember what people did for you, and the fact that somebody invested in you enough to, to give you the gospel. You owe me your own self. Verse 20, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt do also more than I say. So Paul knew. Paul knew that Philemon would forgive him. He knew what kind of man he was. He's saying, I have confidence in your obedience. I know you will do even more than I ask you to do. Verse 22, but withal prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute Epaphras, my fellow soul, prisoner in Jesus Christ, Marcus, Archytas, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So in conclusion this evening, why did God give us the book of Philemon? Well, we see a lesson on counsel. We see a lesson on, um, on forgiving our brothers and sisters in Christ and why. And then what I think is the, the main idea is we see a lesson on investing. And here, as a church, here's how this should work. If you're sitting here this evening, you're already an investment. There's no, that's whether you like it or not. If you're saved, and especially if you're a part of this church, you're an investment. There's people investing a lot into you. But everybody in this church, here's how this whole thing works. You should be an investment, but you should also be a good investor. Who are you investing in? Are you just a bottomless pit of energy and time and people are just investing everything into you as they should, but are you also a good investor? Are there people that you're taking under your wing and there are people you're putting that energy into? Are you in, you should be in a good, in, you should be a good investment. Yes, you should also be in a good investor. There should be people in your life that you are taking the mercy and the love and the effort that both Jesus Christ and others around you put into you and you should be turning around and putting that into as many other people as you possibly can. It's just like that verse said. It said, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. 
That's kind of the idea of this whole sermon is, is forgive, whether it's forgiving people or investing in people. It's you're taking what Christ did for you and you're showing Christ your appreciation for that by putting that into other people. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.